Hello, my name is Will Norman and I'm a reader in American Literature at the University of Kent and today I'm going to be talking about The Great Gatsby and The Voice That's Full of Money. The Great Gatsby was written by F. Scott Fitzgerald and published in 1925 and it's never been more relevant since the 1920s than it is today and I'm going to explain why. The Great Gatsby is one of the most well-known American novels and it's sometimes even talked about as the great American novel. And sometimes I wonder about why that is, not because of any objections to The Great Gatsby, but because there are so many American novels to choose from. What is it about this one that seems to say something particularly powerful? Not only about its own world, its characters and its plot, but about the idea of America itself. The Great Gatsby is about the making of a myth, but it invites us to believe in that myth too. It invites its readers to those sumptuous parties held by great uh, by Jay Gatsby at his house. We drink his champagne and mingle with his beautiful guests. We imagine swimming in that pool with the jazz bands playing beside it. We might imagine owning a beautiful house like his, or a wardrobe, a car like his. But most of all, we want to fall in love like Gatsby falls in love, completely and helplessly in a way that obliterates everything else. Perhaps we want something like that love, to devote our lives to, to give us purpose. But what's this got to do with the United States? Well, the novel itself in its conclusion tells us when it compares Gatsby's dream of winning Daisy to the first settlers in New York, the Dutch sailors who first glimpsed what Fitzgerald calls a fresh green breast of the new world. Gatsby's dream is an American dream based on the myth of colonial adventure and settlement. The idea that those European settlers who first saw America were confronted with something that tested and exceeded the very limits of their imaginations, the promise of conquering some great object of desire. But for all great Gatsby's evocations of beauty and longing, there's another side to this novel one which I think often gets lost in its popular image. For The Great Gatsby carries within it a very dark and troubling set of concerns about death, violence and inhumanity. It gives us a portrait of America riven with racism and class divides, an America which has lost its moral compass and whose very civilization is crumbling. To put this another way, The Great Gatsby gives us the American dream but it also shows us the cost of sustaining it, particularly in terms of white supremacy and grotesque wealth inequality. Those two sides of the novel can't be understood in isolation from one another. We have to see them together in order to understand what it's trying to do and how it speaks to the present. There are various lines of desire in The Great Gatsby. Jay, of course, longs for Daisy. Nick Carraway, our narrator, while well, he falls for Jay in his own way. And we as readers fall for the novel. We fall for its romance. But we have to ask, what is it really that we fall in love with? Does Jay love Daisy or the high class money she represents? Does Nick really admire Gatsby himself or his pink suit? And do we fall in love with the lyrical language of the novel or the beautiful lifestyles within it? This dilemma is encapsulated in Gatsby's description of Daisy's voice, which he says is full of money. Nick's response is very telling. That's it, he says. I'd never understood it before. It was full of money. That was the inexhaustible charm that rose and fell in it, the jingle of it, the symbol song of it, high in a white palace, the king's daughter, the golden girl. Daisy's special appeal and her special wealth are very difficult to disentangle. And it's an odd metaphor when we think about it, a voice full of money. Our voices are unique to us, and we recognise in the voices of those we know well something distinctive about them. But money is never distinctive. It's always the same wherever we find it, insofar as it's something we exchange for other things. Suddenly Daisy's voice could be any rich woman's voice. The only distinctive thing about Daisy's money 
is how much of it she has. It's a question of quantity and not quality. And in this sense, Gatsby is no connoisseur. He's someone who can count. But then maybe at some point one has so much money that one changes in a mysterious way. And that's what Jay and Nick and maybe the novel itself are asking us to believe. The super rich are in some indefinable sense, not just richer than us, but actually different from us. So let's talk about where all the rich people in Gatsby get their money from. Both Daisy and her husband, Tom Buchanan, they come from wealthy families. We know very little, in fact, about where that money comes from, other than they seem to have inherited it from their families. In this sense, they belong to the American elite class, what we might call the 1%, whose wealth comes not from hard work or talent or brilliance, but from an accident of birth. In fact, the secret of their life of leisure is precisely that they do not need to work for money. Their income comes from other sources, from their ownership of assets that deliver profits. This class of society has a particular name, the rentier class, and it runs directly contrary to that key component of the American dream, the idea of meritocracy. In a meritocracy, those who enjoy material privilege have earned it through talent or industry. It's worth remembering then that Daisy and Tom, who to the best of our knowledge have never worked a day in their lives, are the ones who emerge unscathed from the plot of The Great Gatsby. And this fact alone gives the lie to the idea that this novel celebrates the American dream. And what of Jay and Nick? Nick, we discover early in the novel, belongs to the respectable middle class. He has a college degree, he lives in a modest house, in a very expensive part of Long Island. Gatsby, of course, has fabulous wealth that matches that of Tom and Daisy. Only he has earned his money himself, albeit using illegal methods. The interesting thing to note in looking at the sources of Jay's and Nick's money is that they both seem to have got at least some of it from the same source, the sale of bonds. Nick tells us at the beginning of the novel that he moves to New York in order to work in the bonds business and he doesn't seem to be very good at it and he finds it boring. It brings him enough money to pay for a small house in East Egg but not much more. Jay on the other hand we discover was involved in selling fraudulent bonds and we know this from a phone call that Nick accidentally answers at his house following his death. So Nick and Jay curiously mirror each other in their methods of earning money. Nick in the legitimate sphere and Jay in the criminal underworld sphere. It's obvious which one is more profitable. But what is a bond? And what does this particular detail have to tell us about the Great Gatsby? Well, a bond is a financial instrument, a kind of IOU. When an institution such as a company or a government wants to raise money to invest in infrastructure or employees, this is one way of doing it. The institution effectively sells a promise to pay back whomever buys a bond a certain amount of money in the future, an amount greater than the cost of the bond. The sale of bonds was an important part of the boom economy in the Roaring Twenties, and the overvaluation of bonds was one reason why the US economy overheated and crashed in 1929, four years after The Great Gatsby was published. Bonds function through a deferred promise of the future. By the time the bond reaches maturity, it must be paid back by the issuer. The company or the government has grown sufficiently that it's able to honour its promise. In a boom economy, bonds work well since the promises can be kept and faith in a prosperous future can be repaid. In a downturn, however, bond repayments are often defaulted on. The promise cannot be kept. It's significant then that Nick, who professes to be an honourable and honest man, is unable to make great profit from bonds, but that Jay Gatsby, the great Gatsby, 
the Sejisa and fantasist, makes big money from fraudulent promises. His bonds are fake, and he takes the money with no intention of paying it back, with no intention, in fact, of ever paying the investor his dividend. This has huge implications for the plot of the novel because it means that all the wonders of Jay Gatsby's life, his parties, his house, his extravagant lifestyle, and even the car which runs over Myrtle Wilson are built on false promises, on a fantasy of never ending economic growth. And in this sense, in describing Jay's decline as his frauds are discovered, Fitzgerald anticipates that great stock market crash of 1929 when it finally became clear that the wondrous growth of the Roaring Twenties was built on little more than misplaced optimism. Some of the characters in the novel seem to have some distant sense of this truth, even as they continue to thrive materially. For example, Daisy tells Nick early on, you see, I think everything is terrible anyhow. The worry here is that the foundations of prosperity are unstable. And if that's true, then perhaps the values of civilization itself, the privilege of the rich, are also insubstantial. We must recognise then just how much the great Gatsby expresses disgust at the lives of the super rich, the 1% in 1920s America. Tom and Daisy in particular are portrayed as cynical, boorish and unwilling to take any responsibility for their actions. As Nick discloses at the end of the novel, quote, they were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated into their money or their vast carelessness, or whatever else held them together, and let other people clean up the mess that they had made." Unquote. The supreme symbol of this indifference towards the rest of society is of course Tom's treatment of his mistress, Myrtle Wilson, and her husband who live in a deprived working class area between Long Island and Manhattan. Myrtle is used sexually and beaten up physically by Tom before being killed by Daisy as she drives Jay's car back from a drunken spree. Left for dead in a hit and run, Myrtle is the working class casualty of the lifestyle enjoyed by the Buchanans, collateral damage in their own private drama. We should not forget Jay's indifference to Myrtle's death either. When he discovers it, his only concern is to protect Daisy from facing the legal consequences of her actions. But Myrtle, she is forgotten as soon as her mangled body is lifted off the tarmac. But the novel's portrayal of the New York elite is about much more than just money. It's about race too, and the maintenance of white supremacy. Our introduction to Tom is his extolling the merits of a book that he's just read, The Rise of the Coloured Empires, by someone called Goddard. It is in fact a thinly disguised allusion to this book, a real one written by Lothrop Stoddard and published in 1920, called The Rising Tide of Colour Against the White World Supremacy. Stoddard was a eugenicist, that is to say he followed a school of thought popular at the time but now widely discredited by mainstream science, which held that humans could be selectively bred in order to sustain certain advantages, such as intelligence or strength. According to eugenicist thought, certain parts of the population, those understood not to have these advantages, could be excluded from the process. And in this way, eugenics has always been one face of racism and a way in which racist prejudice could be given a veneer of scientific respectability. Stoddard was influential and widely read in the 1920s and 30s, both in the US and abroad. He even influenced Nazi race thinking in the 1930s. And Tom Buchanan is absolutely on board. He tells Gatsby that the book is scientific and irreproachable. The white races are being submerged by the rise of people of colour. The whites have created civilization, and now they needed to protect it from the threat posed by other races. This slide shows Stoddard's race map. He thought 
that the red areas, which he understood as being the terrain of the white races, were in danger of being taken over by inferior black, brown and yellow races. This, we must understand, is the way that Tom sees the world too. So when Tom discovers that Jay Gatsby is in love with Daisy later in the novel, he returns to his favourite eugenicist and racist theme. Nowadays, he exclaims, people begin by sneering at family life and family institutions, and next they'll throw everything overboard and have intermarriage between black and white. What Tom is insinuating here through his character is that Jay Gatsby's own racial identity is non-white, that a marriage between Jay and Daisy would itself be a form of miscegenation, that is to say, as Tom puts it, intermarriage between black and white. Once we begin to pay attention to this question of Gatsby and race, we might notice other details from the novel too, hints that Fitzgerald deploys to suggest that Jay Gatsby might be concealing other aspects of his past. Various scholars have written at length about this question, some arguing that Gatsby is in fact a descendant of black slaves, and others suggesting that he is really Jewish. I don't think Fitzgerald really intended to settle this question of Gatsby's racial identity, but I do think that he intended to raise it. The point here is that Gatsby's whiteness is in some sense in doubt, that the barriers to his entry into the restricted world of the super wealthy are not just about the snobbery of the rentier class and their prejudice against what we would now call new money. It's also about ensuring that those who hold power in the world are white and that the culture the world values, Tom would use the word civilization, is a, a culture that is exclusively controlled by whites. So I want to go back to that strange idea that the novel plays with, the voice that's full of money, the idea that the super rich are in some sense not just richer than the rest, but qualitatively different. And once we begin to take into account the theories of eugenics that Tom follows, it begins to make much more sense. According to eugenic logic, the super rich are qualitatively different in terms of their genetics. They are naturally clever, more refined, cultured, civilised. And those traits are understood in racial terms as quintessentially white traits. For people like Tom Buchanan, this is a scientific truth. For us, it's pseudoscientific racist nonsense, and it's very dangerous too. Why is then The Great Gatsby more relevant today than it has been since it was first published? The reason is that it portrays America at a historical moment that resembles our own in certain ways. To be sure, theories of eugenics are less acceptable now than they were in the 1920s. And that's partly because of their close association with the genocidal crimes of the Nazis in the 1930s and 40s. But eugenics, and their racist assumptions that underpin it have by no means disappeared. And more generally, the great Gatsby's portrayal of an elite class dedicated to maintaining white supremacy, dedicated to the idea of a fundamentally superior white culture, determined to exclude people of colour, whether through economic means or simply through the force of violence, that remains very current. You have to beat them down, says Daisy, about people of colour. We need only need to consider the scenes of police brutality that have been given much media coverage over the summer of 2020 to know that such sentiments never went away among certain sections of American society. Tom's fears about being submerged, as he puts it, by non-white races are found echoed nearly 100 years later in the rhetoric of the far right today, as it emerges emboldened across North America and across Europe. It's important to emphasize that these racist ideologies did not disappear in the intervening time, but that they go through periods of public prominence and visibility appearing more or less acceptable to the mainstream at different historical moments. 
What cannot be denied, however, is that the levels of wealth inequality in the US are currently at a level that was last seen in the 1920s, in the world that was portrayed by the Great Gatsby. The statistics are very clear about this. The 1920s were a decade in which the super rich, the top 0.1% of the wealthy, among whom we can count Gatsby and the Buchanans, increased their share of the nation's wealth from 15 to 25%. Starting with the Great Depression of the 1930s, and then more steeply after World War II, their share decreased dramatically as the US became a society of more evenly distributed wealth. This changed in the early 1980s, coinciding with the election of Ronald Reagan as US president. And it steadily increased in the 40 years since then. Today, the top 0.1% have returned to the position they last had in the 1920s, with their share of the wealth approaching 25% once again. In the UK, incidentally, the trends assume the same shape, even if they're less extreme than in the US. And what this means is that the world portrayed by the Great Gatsby, a world in which a tiny wealthy elite can live a life entirely cut off from the rest of society, causing them great suffering, but never having to take responsibility for it. That's the world that we live in now. The novel is valuable to us in the way it shows how the ugliness and injustice of this world, this world of inequality, can be concealed from us by dreams and fantasies of love and beautiful things. How easy it is for those sealed off from the consequences of their choices to deny the humanity of others. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening.